Good morning and welcome to this 56th commencement ceremony of Methodist Theological School in Ohio. Please be seated. It is my privilege to welcome each of you here today. You come as many different kinds of people from many directions to celebrate in this place. Some of you have been doing this over and over again for some time now, and this is a special day for you. We welcome trustees and former trustees who are here with us today. This morning we recognize and welcome members of our Goldcrest Society and our Sterling Society. Those are folks who have invested over many years in the work you do here and in the preparation you are making for service and ministry, and we are grateful for them and are glad you are here. A word of welcome to faculty, to students, and especially to graduates for this year and your family and your friends. Please join me in a word of prayer. Gracious and loving God, whom we know in many ways and by many names, we have gathered in this place as your people. We have gathered for this special time as we recognize, as we recognize this time of passage. Oh God, we do so recognizing your presence in our midst. You have been with us on this journey. You have moved with us in this place as we have moved with one another, as we have moved through the history and doctrines and thinking of this church. You have moved with us. And today you call us forward to move in ways we cannot yet imagine. We pray as those who seek to faithfully heed that call Oh God, we are grateful for this place, for the history and traditions here, for the opportunities we have to shape and to be shaped, to grow and to help grow, to teach and to learn. 
to be of service to be your people. Be with us in this time now and as we prepare to go forward in ministry and service. Amen. I have the opportunity to introduce to you Dr. Sandra Lutz, who chairs our Board of Trustees. The Board did a number of things in their meeting yesterday that are important to the life of this school. One of the things that they did that is very important to you, they voted to confer your degrees. <laughs> Sandy, I invite you to come forward on behalf of that board and to celebrate with these folks. I bring you greetings and appreciation from the trustees of this institution. A special thanks to all of you who are willing to bring your gifts to this place to be educated. I pray that every one of you have received as much or more than what you hoped for. But we do appreciate you're sharing those, and we hope that you share them in continuum, because as we send graduates out from here, we know that that's just the beginning for you. And a special word of appreciation to all you families who have supported these graduates and now have a full-fledged whatever it is before you. Yes. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Lutz. We have a number of traditions here, and among them now is to have somebody bring the word. It is a blessing this morning to have a bishop of the United Methodist Church with us, Bishop Tracy Smith Malone, relatively new bishop to the East Ohio Annual Conference. She is bishop for many of you. You have a wonderful, wonderful bishop in your conference. You have a biography bore for you, so I won't go into great lengths to be redundant. This is a special person. She's a bishop, but not so long ago, she sat in a place like this, in a position much like yours this morning. She had been working on a call that she had experienced some years before. I had the opportunity last night to, to be in conversation with a colleague who was present, Bishop, at the Pembroke Institute when you were 13. And Dr. McCoy remembers you hearing and accepting the call to Christian ministry. So she's been where you are. She might send some of you where you're going to go. <laughs> but she knows something of what it means to be you today. Bishop, welcome. Good morning. I greet you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Um, greetings. President, Dr. Rundell. Um, greetings, Academic Dean, Dr. Bridgman. Amen. <laughs> to our trustees, faculty, staff, family, and friends, and most of all, class of 2018. <laughs> friends, we know that today is filled with such joy, excitement, and thanksgiving. Um, it is a moment that you have been waiting for and working toward for a time, amen? amen? Each of you have your own unique stories of challenges, sacrifices, victories, and the courage that it took to get here, because it took courage. For all that you have been through, for all that you have overcome, and even for that which is yet to come, we say thank you, Lord. 
And we thank God because we know that we serve a God who can do immeasurably far more than what we can think of, ask for, or even imagine, according to God's goodness toward each of us. So I invite you to hear these words of scripture, words that are taken from 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 13 through 18. We have the same faithful spirit as what is written in scripture. I had faith, and so I spoke. We also have faith, and so also we speak. We do this because we know that the one who raised the Lord Jesus will also raise us with Jesus, and he will bring us into his presence along with you. All these things are for your benefit. As grace increases, to benefit more and more people, it will also cause gratitude to increase, which results in God's glory. So we aren't depressed, but even if our bodies are breaking down on the inside, the person that we are on the inside is being renewed every day. Our temporary minor problems are producing an eternal stock of glory for us that is beyond all comparison. So we don't focus on the things that can be seen, but on the things that can't be seen. For the things that can be seen, they don't last. But the things that can't be seen are eternal. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading, the hearing, and the understanding of his holy word. Let us pray. Most loving and gracious God, you are the true light that illumines our hearts and our lives. Lord God, you fill us with your love, you cover us with your grace, and you pour into us your wisdom and the knowledge. So we say thank you, Lord, for always revealing yourself to us and for always making a way for us as we seek to live into your calling upon our lives. As we gather here today, O oh God, to honor your servant leaders and celebrate the conferring of their theological degrees, Lord, I ask that you pour out a double portion of your Holy Spirit upon all who are gathered here this day. And I ask, O oh God, that you use me as only you know how. Take what I have prepared and let it rest on fertile hearts and minds. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts together be acceptable in thy sight. O oh Lord, you are our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Amen. My message this morning to the graduates and to all of us is knowing your why. Knowing your why. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 13 through 18 is a powerful and prominent declaration of a convicted faith. Paul knows his why. And we find here that Paul's proclamation of his confidence and his trust in Christ as he fully yields himself to ministry for the gospel of Christ, in this message, he is confirming what his why is. He knows his why. And my friends, as you yield yourself to the ministry of the gospel, as you give yourself away for Christ, I encourage you to always know and remember your why when you said yes to God. When you said yes to God's will, when you said yes to God's way, because I am convinced that it is your why that will sustain you for the journey. We see here in 2 Corinthians, again, Paul knows his why. And he speaks a truth. He speaks not only his truth, but he also speaks to our vulnerability. You see, the church in Corinth is faced with many challenges, amen, just as we are here in North America. 
And yet Paul finds proof that the Spirit of God is at work. And he rejoices and he proclaims hope even in the midst of the trouble. And he encourages the church in Corinth, and we find these words of encouragement for us to remain steadfast. Somebody say, remain steadfast. He reminds us that our message, our preaching, our serving is not about we ourselves, but we are proclaiming Jesus Christ, crucified, risen, and one who will come again. As children of God, we are just ordinary vessels that God uses, but it's the power of God, the work of the Holy Spirit, that is at work in us, but we don't ever confuse it's not our power, but it's the power that belongs to God. He says that we will experience all kind of trouble, but we will not be crushed. We will find ourselves even confused sometimes, but by the power of the Holy Spirit, we will not become depressed. We might be harassed, but we are not abandoned. We may get knocked down, but thanks be to God, we won't get knocked out. We will sometimes find ourselves going through the worst, but when things are at their worst, don't we know that God's grace is at its best. My friends, you need to know your why. So Paul writes, we have faith, so we speak, so we lead, so we preach, so we serve, and we do this because we know and we claim that the one who raised Jesus Christ is also the one who raises us and gives us everything we need. Let me say that again. God gives us everything we need to be faithful to the call. God's grace does not take us where his love and his grace will not sustain us. Do you believe that today? Peterson says it this way. We're not keeping this quiet. Not on your life. I believed it, so I said it. And we say what we believe. Amen? And the good news is, I want you to hear this. The good news is, is that God does this for our benefit. It's for our advantage to keep us encouraged, to keep us faithful. Because the more we realize that God is on our side, then the more we place our trust in God's goodness. And the more we experience God's goodness, the more thankful we are. And thankfulness leads to fruitfulness. But it's all for the glory of God. So we never give up and we never give in. And Paul says, how can we? Even when it appears that things are falling apart and don't we know in ministry, sometimes it feels like things are falling apart. Even when doors close, God is always making new life. God is always granting new beginnings. God is always giving new opportunities. God is always expanding our mission field, ever calling us into God's greater purposes. Not a day goes by, not a day or a moment or a second goes by without God blessing you with his grace. Because God wants to get the glory out of your witness. God wants to get the glory out of your ministry, out of your life. It's for our advantage, but it's for God's greater good. We are merely a manifestation of God's goodness and God's glory. Friends, sometimes your testimony, your testimony is all you have. That's why you have to know your why. Your testimony sometimes is all that you have, and might I even say, all that you really need in order to remain steadfast on the journey, in order to lead others into a deep and an abiding faith in Jesus Christ, in order to be God's agents of transformation. 
D.T. Niles, who was a pastor and evangelist, he says this, Christianity is one beggar telling another beggar where he found the bread. Your testimony, your testimony, your convicted faith, your journey is all you need for the journey to sustain not only you, but to help lead and to shepherd others into a deep and abiding relationship with Christ. We know that there are many who are wandering aimlessly through life, seeking love and meaning and purpose and belonging. And there are many who are looking to so many things that often don't give life. The greatest gift that we can offer someone, the greatest gift that we can give is Jesus. Sharing the love of Jesus Christ. Charles Wesley, in that great hymn, he wrote these words, a charge to keep a half, a God to glorify, a never dying soul to save and to fit it for the sky, to serve the present age, my calling to fulfill. Oh, may in all my powers engage to do my master's will. Know your why. We all have a charge to keep. In 1 Peter 5, the word of God says, be shepherds of God's flock that is under your care, watching over them, not because you have to, but because you want to please God. Not calculating what you can get out of it, but being eager to serve, not bossily telling others what to do, not lording over those entrusted to you, but tenderly showing them the way, being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, God will see that you've done it right and will commend you lavishly. Know your why. Not because you have to, but because you want to please God. Beloved, you are not here because you have to. You're here because you made a faithful decision. At some point in your life, you made an important decision to say yes to God, to say yes to ministry. And your yes, it is your yes that led you into these halls. Amen? Amen? It's your yes that led you into your mission field. Not because you had to say yes, but because you wanted to please God. Because you have a desire to offer God's love, to share the good news of the gospel, and to show people the way of Christ, that they might have life and have it the more abundantly. So whether you're pursuing the seminary education for ordained ministry or lay ministry in a local church or for the academy or for the community, whether you feel called to be a community activist or an administrator or a missioner, whatever the call is, God has called you. God has equipped you. And God is preparing you to lead and to watch over people. And let me say that again, to watch over people. God's people. I didn't say the church. Amen? The church is an instrument, amen, of God, but God has called you to lead and to watch over the people, all of God's people. Disciples make disciples, amen? And we teach others to follow Christ by us being lead followers of Jesus Christ. The word of God says that God so loved what? The world, not the church. The church is an instrument, amen, of God's bidding, an instrument of God's love. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. And so often we stop there. We learn that even as a child that we could just recite that particular verse. 
But then it goes on to say that God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through him. Know your why. Because how you share God's love, it matters. The way and manner in which you lead, it matters. And how you choose to live the gospel, it matters. Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. said these words, life's most persistent and urgent question is, what are you doing for others? What are you doing for others? Not what's in it for us that come with prestige and position and power, but what are you doing for others? As bold leaders for the church and for the world, what will you do for others? What are you doing for others? What difference will your ministry make in transforming people's lives and communities? I submit to you this morning that godly leadership, servant leadership, mm -hmm, transformational leadership is rooted in humility, compassion, and courage. And what the church needs and what the world needs are transformational leaders who are humble, who are compassionate, and who are courageous. Well, Bishop, what do you mean when you say being humble? It's recognizing that God has called you for such a time as this. You didn't call yourself. You couldn't call yourself, amen? amen. That God has called you for such a time as this. And being humble does not mean that you shrink from the gifts and the power of the Holy Spirit that is at work in you. Being humble does not mean that you don't use the places and the positions that God placed you in to leverage them to seek justice and equity for all. Being humble is knowing that you can do all things through Christ who gives you strength. And that this extraordinary power that is in you is not from you, but it belongs to God. And this power, this Holy Spirit power, is to will and to work for God's good. Being humble is praying unceasingly and listening to the voice of God and staying in step with God, not getting ahead of God always seeking to please God. Transformational leaders are humble, but they're also compassionate, showing compassion to those who are hurt, those who are broken and those who are marginalized, loving the people and not judging the people over which you have been entrusted to care for. Your ministry is to love, your ministry is to serve, your ministry is to lead. You let God do the judging. There are so many who have turned away from the church, who have turned away from Christianity because we have become too stingy with God's grace. God's grace is not ours to give. But God's grace is ours to share. Compassionate leaders listen to the cries of the needy. You're a voice for the voiceless. You serve people and expect nothing in return. Compassionate leaders go and serve where you have never dared to go and serve before. And lastly, Transformational leaders are humble. Transformational leaders uh -huh, are compassionate. Transformational leaders are those who lead with courage. Friends, I don't have to stand here and tell you that we are living in some desperate times in society and in the church. These are some challenging times in which all of us, amen, 
all of us are being called to lead. Fear, division, and hatred tear at the very fabric of our culture, tear at the very fabric of our church. And our society is one that is increasingly becoming more racially divided, violent. People are quick to label and judge and horribleize the other. We know that the drug epidemic is at an all-time high and destroying lives by the minute. We know this. We know that the suicide rate continues to increase, especially among our young people. We know this. There's increased racial and gender discrimination and injustice. We know this. We need you. We want you. We pray that you would be transformational leaders who will bring healing and hope and reconciliation where there is brokenness and pain. We need you. We desperately need you to be transformational leaders who will break down the barriers of hatred, break down the barriers of fear, be leaders who work for peace, not afraid to advocate for justice, to speak truth to power. Don't ever hear me say this. And I had to learn this on the journey. And I'm constantly always relearning this. Don't ever be apologetic for how your prophetic witness and your mere presence will shift the atmosphere. Let your preaching and your teaching and your discipling defy the boundaries of who's in and who's out. Who's welcome and who's not. You be the ones to teach and to model how God's love and how God's grace transcends our differences in our fears. Dare to challenge the status quo. My friends, as I prepare to take my seat, yours is the task to be a prophetic witness, to tell your faith story, to know your why, to remember your why, and to lead from your why. Always proclaiming that the church of Jesus Christ is still a viable option. It's not a quick fix. We don't always get everything right. And don't we know the church is not perfect? But we, the church, are a people of God who journey together, united in our common witness in sharing the love and the grace of Christ. And we seek to be led by the anointing and the power of the Holy Spirit and that we are committed to the mission of being the hands and the feet of Jesus Christ in the world. Know your why. Proclaim your why. Most importantly, lead from your why. Amen. you stand again and the rest of us will join you as we sing together our hymn.
be seated. Will the candidate for the Doctor of Ministry degree please stand? The Doctor of Ministry degree is designed to provide professionals in ministry with advanced skills for critically and theologically engaged issues and their context in ways that contribute to vital faith communities and institutions. The degree requires the completion of 31 credit hours and a major research project. The research project must demonstrate integration of insights and resources from heritage and practical disciplines and is to grow out of and be related to a particular issue of concern identified in the student's current place of professional ministerial practice. This candidate for the Doctor of Ministry degree has completed all degree requirements and by vote of the faculty and the board of trustees is presented to you for the conferral of the degree. By the authority vested in me by the board of trustees and the state of Ohio and upon recommendation of the faculty, I hereby confer upon you the degree of doctor of ministry with all the rights, privileges, and responsibilities pertaining thereto. Congratulations. Will the candidates for the Master of Arts in Counseling Ministries degree please stand? The Malcolm program seeks to equip persons with broad theological foundations, psychological and behavioral sciences grounding and counseling skills to help troubled persons, families and communities find meaning, healing and growth. These candidates for the Master of Arts in Counseling Ministries degree have completed all degree requirements and by vote of the faculty and the Board of Trustees are presented to you for the conferral of the degree. By the authority vested in me by the Board of Trustees in the State of Ohio and upon recommendation of the faculty, I hereby confer upon you the degree Master of Arts in Counseling Ministries with all the rights, privileges, and responsibilities pertaining thereto. Congratulations. Will the candidates for the Master of Arts in Practical Theology degree please stand? By nurturing personal and public liberating Christian faith, the MAPT degree seeks to equip persons to provide leadership for the formation of individuals and communities. Each MAPT student is required to specialize in one of four areas, ecology and justice, parish and community ministry, spiritual formation and small group ministry, or youth and young adult ministry. These candidates for the Master of Arts in Practical Theology degree have completed all degree requirements and by vote of the faculty and the Board of Trustees are presented to you for the conferral of their degree. By the authority vested in me by the Board of Trustees in the State of Ohio and upon recommendation of the faculty, I hereby confer upon you the degree of Master of Arts in Practical Theology with all of the rights privileges and responsibilities pertaining thereto. Congratulations. Will the candidates for the Master of Theological Studies degree please stand? The Master of Theological Studies degree program provides a broad foundation in the basic theological disciplines. Each MTS student is required to concentrate in Bible, church history, ethics, interreligious context or theology, and to achieve a sufficient depth to read that literature with understanding to intelligently discuss the major topics of their discipline and to conduct relevant research and writing at a competent level. 
These candidates for the Master of Theological Studies degree have completed all degree requirements and by vote of the faculty and the board of trustees are presented to you for the conferral of the degree. By the authority vested in me by the board of trustees in the state of Ohio and upon recommendation of the faculty, I hereby confer upon you the degree of Master of Theological Studies with all the rights, privileges, and responsibilities pertaining thereto. Congratulations. Will the candidates for the Master of Divinity degree please stand? We live in a rapidly changing and complex world in need of the reconciling love of God and the liberating message of the gospel. The Master of Divinity program prepares persons who will proclaim God's good news that liberates from brokenness whose source may be personal, interpersonal, institutional, ecological, and societal. The program prepares students to practice and lead theological practices that promote ministries of personal wholeness, faithful and hospitable community, and justice. These candidates for the Master of Divinity degree have completed all degree requirements and by vote of the faculty and the board of trustees are presented to you for the conferral of their degrees. By the authority vested in me by the Board of Trustees and the State of Ohio, and upon recommendation of the faculty, I hereby confer upon you the degree of Master of Divinity with all the rights, privileges, and responsibilities pertaining thereto. Congratulations. This completes the conferring of the degrees. We will now prepare for the hooding of the Doctor of Ministry graduate and the presentation of diplomas for all members of the class of 2018. The custom of hoods as a component of academic regalia began when medieval monks' cloaks included head-warming cows. Today, the academic hood communicates the owner's school, degree, and field of study through its length and the color of the lining and binding. We will now hood the graduate of the Doctor of Ministry program. Richard John Wilcox, specialization in leadership for transformational change. Richard's, <laughs> Richard's project title is Looking to the Rock from Which You Were Hewn, a history-based approach to leading congregational change. Congratulations, Richard. <laughs> I now present to you the master's degree recipients of the class of 2018.
The Master of Arts in Counseling Ministries Pastor Care and Counseling Track, John Robert Wooden in Absentia. The Master of Arts in Counseling Ministry Addiction Counseling Track, John Robert Schmoll. Master of Arts in Counseling Ministry, Pastoral and Professional Counseling Track, Troy Scott Braswell. <laughs> Pamela A. Garrity. Rebecca L. Hug in absentia. Robert Christopher Wagner. <laughs> Michelle Lynn Walter. Master of Arts in Practical Theology, Alexander S. Clementson with a specialization in Ecology and Justice. <laughs> Patricia Elizabeth Freer with a specialization in Ecology and Justice. Young Ki Lee, specialization in pastoral care in absentia. Kelsey Renee Simpkins, specialization in ecology and justice. <laughs> Master of Theological Studies, Carissa Yvonne Land Landrum, concentration in interreligious context in absentia. Kevin Michael Rodriguez, Concentration in Interreligious Context. <laughs> the Master of Divinity degree. I wanted to make sure that was actually you. <laughs> <laughs> Robert Paul Blanchard with specialization in biblical languages and texts. Robert also is receiving a Master of Theological Studies degree with a concentration in Historical Studies. Andrew Burns. Kevin George Courtright with a specialization in spirituality. <laughs> David Lamont Harris Jr. specialization in black church and African diaspora studies. David also is receiving a master of theological studies degree with a consecration in biblical studies. Emily Howard. <laughs> Sean K. Kidd. <laughs> Richard E. Krebs, Jr. in absentia. Megan Elaine Link. Kevin Joseph Lowry with a specialization in youth and young adult ministry. <laughs> J. 
Joyce L. Euler with, Euler with a specialization in ecology and justice. <laughs> Luigi Perez Perez. <laughs> Victoria M. Robinson. Nicholas R. Shaw. <laughs> Anthony Edmund Thomas. <laughs> Lorenzo Snow Thomas Jr. with a specialization in ecology and justice. Cecil Jacob Fitzgerald Thompson. <laughs> Alex Keith Wiles. <laughs> Kent Harold Winkler. Kiran Lee Yu, specialization in spirituality. Join me now, please, with congratulating all of the class of 2018. Now invite Emily Howard and Sandra Lutz to join together at the podium for an important exchange. Dr. Sandy, in this moment, I feel I know the gratitude for the inspiring education that many of us in this class now who will be prepared and called into ministries uh, newly in the world. May we uh, know that in the times that we've received, we are also praying for the institution that formed us and that we know we will be called into giving. We feel in our hearts the need for ministers to be prepared and trained, knowing that many of them may need some financial assistance to support that endeavor. And so we have founded a new scholarship in the name of the class of 2018. Donating, thank you, with a small uh, beginning, actually, a big one for us it's generous and we know it's a, a small seed that we know will grow and being in faith and hope that we may be preparing new generations newly uh, in the new years of students who will follow we know it's in faith that we present now the 2018 scholarship fund to you i have no money in my hands but a, a formal gift presented now in the ministry of the lives of this class and in our hearts so thank you very much Emily, on behalf of the trustees, I thank you from the depths of my heart. Uh, I see what a difference those kinds of things that begin as small seeds, just like this institution did many years ago, that there is a promise for the future. And the fact that you have chosen as a class to begin a scholarship is very special, and we thank every one of you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Emily. Thank you. Know your why. You've heard it. You've heard it from the bishop. Know your why. Over the years, 
I saw a number of you in the hallways of this place who had a blank look on your face and said, why? <laughs> a call brought you here. If we've done our work well, it's not necessarily only that call that leads you forth from here. The source of that call has not changed, but we hope the call has deepened and broadened because, folks, we've tried to stretch you. Some of you, no doubt, came here thinking you were going to center yourself in your faith. We, we tried to nurture you now and again, but we, we tried even harder to disrupt you. I hope you can find your center after all these years of our trying to move you to the edge. That's what we've been doing. The center's not a bad place, but if we thought that was the only place God was, we'd probably let you be there. But together, we find God not just in the center, but on the edges, in the margins, at the periphery. The center may have some comfort, but we should be discomforted by some of what we meet there. At the center of what most of us know are some habits and patterns and prejudices and biases that we are trying, trying hard to disrupt. We haven't asked you to gravitate toward the center. We've asked you to move out. The comfort in that may well be that almost everything that we feel is central to us was edgy at one time. That's how the prophets have worked with this world. We call you, we call you to what might be, and we call you to be who you might become. The French poet Apollinaire wrote of a voice that called to the people, come to the edge. And they answered, no, we'll fall. Come to the edge. No, we'll fall. Certainly you felt that at times. <laughs> Give me something to hold on to. These questions are brilliant. But what if I fall? What are you giving me to hold on to? Come to the edge, he said. No, we'll fall. Come to the edge. They came. And he pushed them. And they flew. Come to the edge, friends. It's time for you to go. And if you don't go, we're going to push you. <laughs> you came here for a reason. You came to prepare for a purpose that may have changed along the way. It may have grown. It may have widened and broadened. It may have deepened. You are not there yet. None of us are. But it's time for you to take a step. Come to the edge and fly. But for God's sake, go. <laughs> the world needs, the world desperately needs, this broken, hurting world desperately needs the work you have prepared to do. Go in grace. Go in peace. Go. Amen. <laughs>